All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my, my uh, next LinkedIn live session. Uh, six weeks into lockdown. If you're not used to working from home by now, I think uh, we, have, we've got, we have a different conversation to have. Uh, although it looks like the world is slowly going to open up, I hope you're ready for the world that comes after COVID-19. Um, as last time, my objective is not to, uh, to talk about uh, all the things that are happening around COVID-19. There are 320,000 other streams that are talking about this. I would like to take this opportunity for, 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 for me to invite guests and share some knowledge around HR technology. Um, and today, specifically, I've got uh, Anton Fishman who joined me. Hi, Anton. Uh, hi there, Paul, and hello to everyone who's watching this live stream, wherever you happen to be. Absolutely. <laughs> well, it's, we, we're covering quite a few countries, uh, Anton, so it's going to be it's going to be an, an interesting conversation, hopefully, on the stream. Just a quick introduction for yourself. Uh, you've been you've been in the HR fraternity for for quite a long time, uh, focusing on on leadership, talent, and organizational development, and then specifically later on uh, moving into the HR tech space and then even more specifically around uh, around artificial int intelligence i love the fact that you call yourself an ai educator uh, and as such i know that your regular chair and speaks at uh, at hr technology conferences on the topic and that you are supporting a number of large organizations in the transformation to the uh, a digital transformation in hr specifically around uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning I hope I did you justice there, Anton, but uh, um, just, uh, just maybe a few more things about uh, what you've been up to. Uh, well, I, I think you've done uh, justice. You were very kind enough to, to not say how long I've been uh, working with HR, which is about 35 years. Um, uh, and uh, I think the only thing I, I would like to add is that all the way through my, my, um, my working life, both as a consultant and running consultancies and, and um, and the more recent things. My focus has really been on helping HR establish itself as a strategic and influential function. Um, mm. uh, I'm helping HR raise its game and uh, my involvement uh, in this space at the moment uh, is not because I'm a techie, I, I'm not, but because I see this as an extraordinary opportunity um, for HR to uh, connect to a major change challenge that, that businesses have as, as they themselves adopt AI and machine learning and how HR itself can shift its proposition and improve the service qualities to the business and to employees through the use of these technologies. So first and foremost, it is yet again about HR and HR's impact. So just just a quick 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 one before I ask you the, 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 the start question that we had to, that we had in mind on have you has you seen an acceleration in, in HR adopting technology in order to reframe their position and to offer different value? Um, look, HR has been um, playing with technology for a long time. Um, uh, as we know, um, the introduction of uh, large-scale HR information systems goes back 20, 25 years. Uh, HR has um, slowly become adept at using that, um, the transition to the cloud. Um, uh, but uh, most of the, uh, the challenges associated with that have been the challenges of implementing large-scale IT systems, which often have taken a year, two years, three years to implement effectively. What's really interesting now is that we have got um, a vast array of innovative uh, young consultancies who are bringing new technologies and new capabilities, which can be implemented really very, very quickly. And what I've seen over the last three or four years is um, great curiosity um, and increasing interest and appreciation of the differences that this can make. But the take up is still really quite slow because I think HR is trying to still get its head around the potential, the complexities, and the way in, in which um, these really interesting propositions um, can be integrated in, into current practice. The tough thing is how it transforms the proposition itself. And maybe that's something we'll talk about at the end of this conversation. Thank you. So what, what, what have you seen specifically in the last two or three years? What has been the focus around the HR tech space development? What, what yeah. have you seen emerge? 
Uh, the, 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 the one that has um, both had the, the single largest investment in terms of technology development and, in, and the largest take up has been in, in the recruitment space. Um, mm -hmm. In many ways, the ability to partially automate, to gain deeper insights and to personalize the experience of candidates and to provide better person job matching uh, really suits these emerging technologies. And it has been the uh, it is the most mature area of application. Um, and I think there are very few organizations who are not checking this space out and quite a lot who are now getting practical experience there. Uh, but there are many other areas of, of, of HR practice that are beginning to explore uh, the, the use of this, and some, some of which are um, uh, about back office automation and, and um, uh, tier one um, query handling and call centers. Um, others are actually much more sophisticated in areas that we perhaps wouldn't expect, such as the AI executive coach. Um, yeah. Or the, the incursion of, of machine learning into the world of well-being. Um, and okay. we'll touch on those, I think, a little bit later. Yeah, we will. We will. Absolutely. So I, I'm, obviously, I'm very pleased to hear that in the recruitment space, the, the majority of investment comes on with the talent games because that's that's the space that we're trying to uh, uh, create a very different uh, candidate experience as well as efficiency and bias-free efficiency in the recruitment process. And similarly, uh, we've seen a tremendous uh, interest in not just how we can make it better, but specifically also on how we can even change it versus the competition. How can we stand out versus the competition? Because obviously the whole candidate experience is a competitive uh, competitive landscape. Uh, but let's 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 talk about it a little bit a little bit more. Um, I think I think one of the things that we talked about was uh, no, let me put it differently. Everybody's heard of artificial intelligence. Everybody's heard of machine learning help people understand what it means from your perspective. And I think you've shared a slide with me. Shall I just put that on so, uh, so uh, people yeah. can, can just view that? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering whether you can make that. Is that big enough? I can't um, make it big enough. OK, I, I hope it's um, uh, big enough for everyone to, to see. That, that That's great. Um, we put this slide together there to perhaps um, get a little bit of clarity about our ah, perfect um, both some of the language that's going on some of the technologies underpinning this and also some of the applications so there's quite a lot going on in this slide and what I'd like to do very briefly is talk us uh, through this from from the bottom left hand side the lowest step going all the way up to to, to the highest step there um, and and to use this to illustrate that there are um, a number of different both technologies but also approaches to the application of what I would normally call machine learning rather than artificial intelligence here. Okay. Um, uh, the, the bottom uh, end is really a focus on improving, automating uh, and um, advancing um, practical things, processes and, and as we got it down there, the little robot, the bot doing stuff. As we progress up, we move into data, data analysis, uh, sense making, decision making uh, and insight which takes us closer to the thinking end of the application of, of AI machine learning. Um, and in the process, what I'd like to do is just quickly go up those steps. We have been, mm, uh, we have been automating processes for quite a long time using simple things like macros and, and, and the like. Um, um, a macro is a, an automation process. Uh, and back office automation um, is something that um, all uh, HR functions, um, I think, have been looking at for some time to, to come. What we are seeing now is the, the taking of that to the next level of smarts, if you like, by applying some aspects of, of machine learning to this, which might be the, the ability of computers to, to look at and read and make sense of a document so that if information is placed on, on, on a CV or on a letter, you don't need to predefine fields. So it knows what an address looks like. It doesn't matter what the typeface is. It finds it and it can tra translate that uh, and put it onto a document there. And, and, and the, the RPA, the robotic process automation, is an area that actually is already quite mature in a number of, of, of back office situations and is now drifting in, into HR. But it's essentially taking process automation and efficiency to the next level. 
uh, there had been a barrier in, in, in the capability of, of, of tech to do this, and that barrier is now being broken quite significantly. And we'll talk about RPA, I think, in, in one more slide there. But if we move out of the, the just the automation of processes and the intelligent automation of processes, which, by the way, drives efficiency and cuts down um, uh, the amount of time that, that, that people are doing, what, in all honesty, are boring and robotic jobs just done yeah. by humans, and, and move on yeah. to the data side. Um, we have been seeing, I think, in, in HR probably for the last five or six years, uh, at long last, um, a real um, embracing of data as, as a source of, of insight mm -hmm. and influence. Uh, and, and data analytics as a capability in HR is now being developed. We have data analytics teams, and we're moving on from just the reporting and, and representing of data in, in nice charts to actually higher order uses of, of data and statistics. And as we move into what's called predictive analytics, in other words, uh, getting large amounts of data, looking at the patterns, looking at the correlations, and being able to create insights in terms of what might happen on the basis of what we know. This is now taking us into the into uh, machine learning areas. Uh, and in particular, um, if we talk about uh, recruitment, uh, uh, the, the engines that are being developed there to say, look, uh, we put people through um, a selection process, an assessment process. We know what uh, uh, other successful people have done. Let us make a prediction as to who of these candidates is likely to be better for the organization uh, where a um, machine learning is coming in. And I think where you are coming in, that's predictive analytics. Can I can I give a specific example of that? Uh, because we've really recently done a, uh, done a study for one of the clients that we did our uh, gamified assessments for. And we've been looking at how people have scored on their gamified assessment. And then subsequently, we have seen how each of those candidates has progressed through the recruitment process, the recruitment funnel, up until the end that they've been appointed. And our data scientists have now been able to create a data model in which on the basis of the assessment score with a certain 70% 70 confidence, they can now predict just on the basis of playing an assessment game, whether a person is going to be hired by that company or not going to be hired by that company. And I think 70% confidence in any recruitment, uh, uh, as any recruiter would know, that is, that is a pretty high, uh, pretty high, uh, pretty high number. Uh, so that over time, what we can see is in terms of uh, taking that forward is that instead of doing two more steps in that whole recruitment funnel, you can actually take those steps out and start relying just on the assessment score and the demographics that people have. And I, I think that's, that's a good example of these predictive analytics, isn't it? That, that, and that's very impressive, Paul. And I think a very, very good example of, of the way in which once you've got that capability, um, uh, it enables you to do a, a number of things, one of which is to, to, to question the processes that you've adopted in the past and, and ask whether they add value or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, the consequence of that is you can often significantly speed up the process uh, from initiation to decision making. Yeah. And that's yeah. not only a benefit to, to the organization themselves, but actually is a great benefit to the, in your instance, there, the, the, the candidates. Uh, if you can take what might be a, a four or five or six week experience and, and convert that into a two week experience, not only are you more likely to hang on to good quality candidates before they go somewhere else, but even those who don't go through the process successfully feel much better about that. And it leads to a very good impression of the company itself. True that, true that, true that. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about okay. the so and narrowing. Move on to, to some of the other um, steps that's there. I've introduced some of the the, um, the language that's being used more generally in, in the world of AI, um, deep learning, narrow AI, and connected AI. And very briefly, I just want to talk about that. Um, deep, deep learning is um, is really taking the, the analytics to, to a much, much uh, more sophisticated level. Um, and... Um, I'm sure many of the people who've been watching this are, are aware, if you like, of the work of, of Google and, and DeepMind, where um, the game of, of Go has, has now been um, mastered 
um, by um, a deep Blue. learning process. In other words, what, what, what we're seeing here is um, uh, technology companies and researchers there essentially mimicking the, uh, the, the processes that happen in our brains, um, the, the, the neural processes of, of, of the brain and brain networks there, and, and, and in a sense creating analogs structural analogs and the way in which uh, computers learn, which enables computers to do uh, um, things that we would call uh, aspects of intelligence, to perceive, to look at, to understand what they're seeing and looking at, to listen and understand what, what they're listening to, to speak to us and make sense uh, to us. So our day-to-day our -day experiences are things like, like Siri and Google uh, and others where we talk to our computers, we talk to our phones, they hear us, they do what we want, they make suggestions, we do it back. It's all driven by deep learning. And this deep learning technology is now powering um, other technologies that are supporting the HR space. Because if, if AI can listen to you and talk back, then it can also be your coach, for instance. Um, you can talk to it, it can talk to you, um, it can learn about you, it can make some suggestions, and we might give one or two examples of the AI executive coach. Um, it may be able to listen into conversations and do a behavior analysis, uh, uh, as one of the, uh, the startups that I work with is doing, that, that listens through um, deep learning processes to um, team meetings and gives feedback to, to the team leader about how the, the meeting has gone and how they could have um, shared that better and feedback to the individuals about their contribution and how they oh, might have all wait, of these wait, wait. things. <laughs> that blows my mind. So you're saying that there is a startup that's working on recording and listening in on meetings and telephone conversations and on the basis of that recording interpretate that and give the line manager suggestions on how he can do better in terms of leading his team absolutely a company called winning minds um, now that that could not happen without the advances to be made in the last two or three years in the thing called deep learning and a, a narrow field called natural language processing nlp ah. um Moving on to that, that very, very specific application, which, which you, you picked up there, which is to, to listen to, to a team meeting and analyze it, is, is what's been called narrow AI, um, where, where you have got a very, very specific application of these technologies to solve a very particular problem that takes a long time to train. And the use of narrow AI is there to contrast it with what is in if like the science fiction and public domain about the notion that AI is suddenly going to become powerful, take over the world. It's going to be as smart as you and me in all senses, what's called general AI or broad AI. It's still science fiction, it's not there, but actually what we're getting is very, very specific, narrow applications of AI, whether it's around feedback, whether it's around recruitment um, in our own fields or many others in, in, in general, industry uh, where we're getting smart in a very very narrow field and ignorance everywhere else and the last level i've got is where lots of different narrow ais in complementary areas are then synthesized to connect them one to the other to improve an entire people process Mm. where you might have um, uh, re uh, recruitment personalized feedback onboarding um, um, AI uh, products integrated to cover the entirety of the go-to-market um, selection process and establish you through your first 100 days as a connected, integrated service. That's amazing. That's amazing. How, how far are we from there, uh, Anton, in your view? How long will uh, we take? Uh, we're actually quite a long way. We... we uh, there are examples from the bottom to the top already. Really? Uh, Including connected yeah. AI? Yeah. Uh, what we haven't got is, is a widespread adoption with many, many companies using this, and it's becoming the standard. But I, I have seen and I know of organizations who, who are, are doing everything in every single one of those boxes, and I know companies who are developing products um, 
uh, in, in all of those two. I, I just I, I ask people to uh, to post questions below. I'm I, I'm just encouraging people to do so by taking one question from Leonardo, who says this this thing about listening in into meetings is that not against uh, personal privacy? What the, the are short answer is if it's done um, without permission, of course it is. Uh, so so the, the the only way this works is with permission. Um, no. And um, it, it's it is being used for development purposes. Um, it's being used uh, hand in hand with team coaches, human team coaches who are using this to to, to gather data. Um, and it's it's again being used also um, in problem solving, because often uh, if uh, the dynamics in a team aren't working, everyone knows it's not working, but often they don't really understand why. Uh, and this is a diagnostic tool, which, again, with permission there, there is often both interest, curiosity and a need to get under the, the skin of what is it about the way in which we engage one with the other. But but your your, your questioner is absolutely right. Um, this is this is um, uh, this would not be right morally or legally um, to to just eavesdrop without that explicit permission. Yeah. Well, thanks. Can we, can we just? Uh, I know that you've got a specific example around chatbots. Can we just? Uh, can we just? Uh, where, yeah, here's my slides. Uh, oh, okay. What, okay. Um, what's, what's I'm working on the assumption. Yeah, I'm working on the assumption that people know what a chatbot is, but but it uh, that may not be true for everybody. Um, these days, um, almost every time you go onto a website and a little box appears in the corner that says, can I help you? Or you go onto uh, a website to buy things and a little box pops up and says, you seem to be interested in this, you might be interested in that. At least half the time, that conversation is not with a real person, but is with what's called a chatbot. It, it's, it's a little robotic engine there that, that has a fair amount of understanding of what's being said, a particular deep knowledge about whether it's the clothes that are being sold, or in this instance here, queries about um, um, HR data. And we have a couple examples here of organizations that, that are being used, uh, substituting, if you like, tier one coal handlers with bots. Um, often 80% of the, the questions that, that come into an, an HR call center are highly predictable. How many days leave yeah. have I got? Where can I find the information on the performance management process? Um, I, I'm moving. Um, who do I tell about my new address? Yeah, what policies uh, are? And uh, these these questions are both predictable. They're they're easy to respond to because it's access to a to a database. They're pretty, and actually they take up the time from from call handlers who who should be spending more time on tier two, tier three, more complex and more sophisticated engagement. And so what we are seeing is is the use of of, of chatbot methodologies to in query handling in call centres. Um, and there is a, there are technologies to support this. There are, um, some are homegrown, as we're, we're seeing in, in a number of financial services institutions who developed sophisticated chatbots to engage with the external customer, who are now developing chatbots to engage with the internal customer. Yeah. Uh, and essentially, this, this is taking what's already quite a mature technology, cus external customer facing, and now taking it into the way in which HR or IT help desks and other help desks are engaging with their internal customers. So the, the whole the whole HR um, transactional services uh, that is quite a few of our of our colleagues are are engaged in that activity with chatbots, with integration, with automation. Uh, is there any HR service delivery person left? Um, the experience so far, both, both in, in terms of um, external customer facing uh, things and, and internally, is that, and I say so far, uh, is that all you're doing is taking away the, the, the boring and un, uninteresting things and actually uh, gi giving um, uh, shared service uh, uh, professionals uh, more time to deal with the things that actually need more time. Uh, mm. and at the moment, there are no signs of loss of jobs. What we're seeing, and this is, I think, quite typical of the use of these technology, is that we're actually taking away those parts of jobs which were robotic anyway and giving them properly to the robots and actually enriching the remaining time. 
that that professionals have. And so the, the, this is part of, uh, part of task reallocation and if you like, um, upskilling uh, and providing humans to do what is most human, which is to engage in the much more complex, sensitive um, uh, and uh, slightly unpredictable um, high quality conversations. But that, but that's, and maybe we talk a little bit about it at the end when we talk about HR, how HR can adopt and work towards it. But one question from Wakasa just got is also that, uh, how can you people that are, that are focused on this, this, this more efficiency different processes that are used to doing this for the last 20, 25 years, uh, taking them out and doing more. Uh, 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 more advanced roles is, of course, a huge transition that either they're not capable or sometimes they're not willing to do so. So that whole change management component of getting organizations to adopt that kind of technology is, of course, extremely important, correct? Absolutely correct. I mean, if, if HR knows anything at all, it should know and understand the issue of, of change and transformation at a personal as well as an organizational level. And HR needs to look after itself as well as it looks after the rest of the business. So HR has its own learning agenda. Uh, HR has its own change needs. Um, and as long as we apply our own skills to ourselves, and I know that sometimes we don't because we look after our clients better than we look after ourselves. Um, but as, as long as we, we, we take everything we know about that, um, uh, it's, it's not a difficult task, but it, it just um, requires investment, planning, training needs analysis, um, good design and a managed transition. And we Absolutely. know these things work if they're done well, and we should just look after ourselves, as I say, as well as we look after others. Well, that was, that was a question from Wakaz Emmet. Uh, so I, I, I think the old saying goes uh, that the, the son of the, the shoemaker has not, has, has uh, worn out shoes. Yeah, correct? Yeah, I think that's, right. that's what is. Uh, Janara just asked around uh, what are specific examples of companies that are working in that space. Can I just show you that uh, that map that you uh, that you've got yeah. just to show how how, uh, uh, how how extensive the numbers of providers are in yeah. this uh, technology space. And last last session with uh, with HR Tech Singapore also had an HR Tech ma uh, map uh, similar to this. And the number of providers is just mind boggling, isn't it, uh, Anton? Um, absolutely. And, and this has been a reflection both of the opportunities that have been created by technology, which can now do this stuff. And five years ago, it truly could not. But also because we have seen a, a large amount of investment um, from private equity uh, and from others going in, into the startup space. But as you can see here, it's, it is confusing, utterly confusing for, for, for companies about not only on knowing who's out there, but how do you make choices? Who do you talk to? Particularly since most of these are young businesses without a long track record. Um, uh, these are not the usual big company players, but this is where the innovation is taking place. Um, but it's really, really tough for companies to make sense of this. And this is only, as, as the slide says there, the top 125. You can multiply this 10 times over. Wow. Yeah, I see, I see that we're not mentioned yet. So That's my marketing guy has old. to talk to and, and so you, you might, you might oh, be the best three years old. Oh. That, makes, that makes me slightly feel better. <laughs> um, and the, the other thing, of course, is then around integration, isn't it? That so many different components of different elements. Uh, you don't want your, your employees or your candidates to deal with 16 different apps in which they have to manage their employee lifecycle. Uh, so I think that's that's the other big big question. That of course, do you think that's going to change? Is there going to be a yeah, well, a, a, being integration over time that makes that easier? Yeah. Well, um, it is changing al already um, in in um, in two ways. One of which is it's not surprising that the really big um, um, HR tech companies are not sitting down and watching all this happen. So we're beginning to see some of the the classic. Um, enterprise-wide HR tech companies um, building uh, some aspects of, of this capability um, into their systems. But um, it's much harder uh, for them to do so at the pace that these companies do. And so what we're beginning to see is the emergence of two architectures. 
one of which is really, really sound and robust uh, core uh, HR information systems with an overlay of um, uh, capabilities drawn from these sorts of businesses sitting on top of that uh, and with information going backwards and forwards. And companies are beginning to look at a sort of plug and play uh, approach where they are cherry picking um, uh, narrow AI applications while still sitting on a very robust, large scale HR information system there. Uh, and I think that's probably the way we are, are, are moving, which is yeah. not a monolithic one, but, but actually to have this, this skin of very, very precise, really very interesting, narrow applications integrated underneath by a sophisticated database. Yeah. Maybe we spoke in our, in our pre-conversation pre around one or two examples. Uh, yeah. can, can you take, take us through? You, you mentioned about the executive coach. I think we've got one around uh, uh, some user examples around the case study. Uh, sorry. Yeah. This, uh, this is around uh, automation, correct? Uh, this is back office automation. So this, this is um, uh, an example of some consultancy work done by a company called Varan, who um, are a tech integration business in, in, in the UK, who I've done some research with around how HR is adopting AI. So, so this is one of their slides there. But they work with um, one of the large government departments. Um, uh, some of your, your viewers um, may know about this thing called Brexit, uh, the UK's um, exit from, from the uh, European Union. Uh, one, one of the, um, the big challenges that will come with this is that our border controls are going to have to change very rapidly. And the Home Office is responsible for this. And they have got a major, major recruitment exercise uh, ongoing. And um, basically, they, they uh, worked uh, with the technology provider of RPA called UiPath in this, in this country to, to address um, how um, uh, the recruitment, uh, large scale and rapid recruitment could be automated. Um, and they went through the processes what, um, on the left, which is a, a whole process analysis, identifying pinch points, uh, really understanding where automation, smart, intelligent automation could come in, built the business case and implemented this in, in about six weeks, which, which is really quite remarkable for, for an HR integration. And, and what we're seeing, some, some of the outcomes that are taking uh, place there, because what we are really seeing is not, not a deep level re-engineering, but a high level automation of existing processes, but by, by putting in very, very smart connections and decision points and, and, and insights that the RPA, the robotic process automation is doing. And so in a very short period of time, which is six weeks there, um, already a rapid reduction in, in, um, in, 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 in manpower on the one time, time to hire, improving the candidate experience, and actually in the process, because they were also looking at the selection processes, improving, improving the diversity that went there. But I think one of the things that's coming out of this and other instances there is the opportunities, and in fact, the need for HR is to adopt um, rapid prototyping um, mm. and, and to move towards a, a much more lean approach um, to, to projects. Uh, partly because technology moves very quickly. And if you're working for six or nine or, or 12 months on a project there, the technology is different at the end than it was at the beginning. But also because the technologies enable you to experiment and test and prototype very rapidly. And this is one of the other changes in terms of how HR itself conducts itself and operates. And the move towards lean, which we're beginning to see in some, some um, uh, HR functions, and the adoption of design thinking, design methodology, which underpins this case study there, is one of those things that we're also learning is enabling uh, companies to, to be smart users of these emerging technologies. Yeah. There's a, one or two questions, Shabazz Emmett, and uh, we, where was the other one? Iqbal Parak uh, asked questions around do we do you think and I will, I will start answering it and you, maybe you can take over from me uh, Anton do you think that emerging markets are ready to take over to start implementing these kind of, of, of AI solutions um, my personal view and please add, add and or change that if, 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 if it need be I, I don't think that there's a that there's a significant difference between developing or developed countries and the ability to adopt AI I think at the end of the day, it's all around what is the value that, that they're going to create 
Yeah, and whether that value is efficiency, which is probably more in a developed country because of high salary costs, or whether that's to do with a employee experience or a candidate experience. I do think that there's not that there's not a that there's not a significant difference, and of course within an emerging market or within a developed market, there are business leaders or CEOs or owners of companies that are that saying that this is all hocus pocus and we're not interested. But there's also quite a few of them in any part of the world that says, yes, I can see the value and I want to innovate and take this forward. Do you think there's any difference? Um, I, I agree with everything you said, but I, I, I'd, I'd like to add just two comments. Uh, one of which is I really don't differentiate um, between the, the, those two, two different um, marketplaces, if you like, when it comes to the quality of professionals. Um, um, I, I think that the, the training, the development and experience of a lot of people in HR is very high. Um, um, uh, uh, in, in, in your part of the world, Paul, and, and, and elsewhere. My analogy uh, that I want to use, uh, I think, comes from from telecoms. Uh, one, one of the things that we actually saw about 10 years ago was that in the developing world, the telephone system there was lagging a long way behind that of the developed world. Along came a new technology. And in a matter of a few um, years, what we saw was that um, telecoms in, in what was so-called developing countries countries were suddenly more advanced than in other parts of the world and I, because they were able to leapfrog old technologies they didn't have some, some of the, um, the, the the generational complexity of going from, from generation three to generation they just went from generation one to generation four without stopping I think this is the opportunity in developing there's no reason not to go straight to the most sophisticated applications of these technologies in one leap and it might even be easier in the developing world to, to, to jump to the, the front than it is in more sophisticated and complex organizations who are deeply embedded in a technology that's difficult to let go of. And that, that, that brings us directly into the conversation around huh, if I'm an HR director of an organization, what what steps should I take or what how do I start myself on this journey or digital transformation and specifically using AI? Right. I, I think that there there are just two or three things um, that, that I, I would suggest. And the first one is start learning. Um, this is my a, AI educator hat. Um, it's not as complicated as it seems. And indeed, what I can do is I can send one or two links uh, to you, Paul, to, to pass on to other people. Uh, I, I introduce myself as saying I'm, I'm not a techie. Um, I, I just read a lot about this. Um, and it, it, within two or three weeks of, 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 of reading, uh, uh, reading some articles, reading one or two books about this, uh, just keeping up to date, uh, and, and making sure that your teams around you uh, uh, have sufficient but not deep understanding. It, it adds not only an insight to HR, but actually enables you to, to start to have credible conversations with the rest of the business. Uh, and once you start to, to, to be credible, and once you get your colleagues and senior leaders in the business to really be asking themselves the question, what does AI and machine learning mean for us, for our competition, for our marketplaces, for the opportunities to change here? Uh, you can lead that conversation, which is not normally the place that HR has. Secondly, get to know and understand the marketplace. Uh, you don't actually have to, to figure out uh, who are these thousand companies there, but start to do a little bit of investigation as, as to who are doing some is interesting things. What are the products there? And also come to uh, some, some very, very simple criteria about how you would judge for yourself. Uh, whether these are really well-founded um, companies and well-founded products, or whether there is hype. So if you can become, an, if you know the marketplace, if you become generally aware and understanding, so you sound credible to your colleagues and to your, 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 your senior management, and if you are able to make um, an informed purchase and start experimenting with this, you've gone a long, long way. And you can do all of that in six months. 
So Sajjad just asked the question of how, and that fits a little bit in terms of understanding the market and solutions that are out there. Because he asked how many of these solutions are advanced data models at the back or just truly AI or machine learning platforms. And that fits a little bit in our conversation around uh, that everybody proje projects themselves to be uh, uh, at the forefront of, uh, of, of technology. Maybe not as many are. So how how would I how would I go through that bubble? So first of all, uh, he's absolutely right. Um, there has been so much hype about this. Everyone is now saying AI this, AI power this. Um, uh, there was a lovely piece of, of, of investigative research um, only about six months ago that came to the conclusion that at least forty percent of so-called AI products have no AI at all. Um, right. uh, <laughs> Uh, a fair amount of others are have um, um, uh, quite sophisticated decision trees behind them, but actually don't have AI. Um, others, uh, um, as again your question has said, have got some pretty good data analytics, but no AI. I, I would say probably uh, machine learning and AI is 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 well established in ten to fifteen, maybe twenty percent of these. And and so first of all, you're right to be skeptical. Um, but it's not to uh, on the basis of excluding all claims. You just need to to, to formulate so, some simple inquiries to to get um, the vendors to be able to explain how it is, um, what what the learning sets that they used, and the ones that I find most interesting are, are those that are not only most open but also talk about the limitations of their technology uh, as well as their capabilities. Uh, and if people are, are are willing to do that and are able to say very clearly what it can do, what it can't do, what it might be able to do, and how they're investing um, in some of the deep learning technologies and the data in order to, to learn, then I think you've got something to trust. Can I, uh, I've got two more topics and then maybe one or two other questions if you if you allow me on top. Of course. Um, one, is, one is around, uh, we talk about digital transformation, uh, we talk about automation, uh, Sarah just asked a question around how can you make sure wh where does the human element still fit in? What, what, how, how is that gonna, how is that gonna emerge? And link to that maybe then the whole moral elements around AI and machine learning and applying that in uh, in in, uh, in HR. Yeah, and so I know these are big questions. I, I think they're, gr they're great questions, and, and you know I can talk about this for a long time. Uh, let me just um, pick up on, on, on the where does the human emerge. I think the hu humanity emerges when we take the mechanical out of what we do. Um, ah. uh, uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is, is to throw just another term into um, this. So AI is beginning to be discussed and, 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 and used as augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. And what lies behind this is, um, I, I think, a very, very um, satisfying um, understanding of technology, which is that technology is there is to augment the work that we as humans do, not, mm, to, like not to replace that. And I think that the, the real long-term opportunity for HR is to become an augmented professional function uh, that actually mm. uses its human skills, its professional skills there, but to, to have them raised to a much higher level through the collaboration uh, that, that, that we have as professionals with these smart technologies. Um, okay. uh, so these are augmentation tools. And, and again, the simple analogy that I have uh, and the audience I found least worried about this when I, I started to talk about this four or five years ago were architects but I, and, and people involved in, in uh, uh, manufacturing design. Uh, things like computer-aided design, very, very smart technologies have taken away what used to be one of the core skills of, of people, of engineers, and which was to sit at a drawing board with set squares and, 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 and to draw things. And that, that skill has gone. Architects often define themselves with their draftsman skill. Now they interact every day with, with extraordinary technologies that enables them to, to, to produce 3D models, to engage with this. We still have architects, but they are building better buildings, buildings which are more imaginative. It's enhancing creativity. It's enhancing functionality of that profession. And 
I actually see that the humanity and professionalism emerges through the collaboration that we have with these smart technologies. And, and let us be where extraordinary architects have already got to within our own profession. Don't be afraid of it. It, it, is, a, a, it is your partner in delivering services. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to frame this 30-second clip, Anton. I think uh, you've articulated this so beautifully. Uh, I'm going to frame this and send it to all my HR colleagues. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so then the, the moral side. How yeah. does the moral side, the well, ethical side? Uh, it, it, actually, this is a big, big issue. Uh, uh, and it, it, it's one that I think is something we should all be worried about. Uh, first of all, we do have the capabilities, one of your earlier questioners have, to um, go beyond um, permission to eavesdrop and, and, and to start the process of surveillance. And we do see this, as we all know, at state level in, 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 some, organ in some countries, but we also do have um, companies who, who are um, indulging in, in surveillance of, of, of their employees um, in this way. And that raises some, some fundamental issues there. But we have deeper ones. And that goes to, to, to this, this area of um, how do we train uh, these smart systems to understand what's going on in the world? And the way it's trained is we provide them with a lot of data that humans have actually already coded and analyzed and said, look, th this is the way the world is. Um, this is a person. This is a car. Um, this is a tree, which is the way they train driverless cars to look at the world. Um, now, when it comes to uh, training uh, data on humans, if we ourselves are biased and our training data embodies those biases, then the people technologies that use that training data are themselves biased. So the, a whole big area, which is called algorithmic bias, is an area that as, um, lawmakers are looking at, regulators are looking at, pressure groups are looking at, and driving bias out of people-based decision-making um, is going to be one of the biggest hot topics. So AI ethics, algorithmic bias um, are... are are some of the most critical things. And certainly in the UK, where I know things most, we've got uh, government departments looking at algorithmic bias. Uh, we have got a whole series of, of professional bodies looking at that. We've got technical bodies looking at it. And, and we have got uh, campaign groups addressing these issues. And I know that there are, this is being repeated across the world. South Korea in particular has been looking at AI ethics for a long time. The United States has been uh, addressing these issues. Big companies are doing it. Whether you call it morality, whether you call it ethics, whether you call it driving bias out of this, it's a big issue, and we're a long way from solving that problem. Yeah. Um, and and I think I think that will take that will take quite. Uh, first of all, it's about understanding your own biases before you can learn somebody else what those biases are. I think that is the that is the, the bigger bigger issue. If you don't understand, the only thing that I always say, uh, Anton, is that uh, it's, it's very interesting that we accept that humans make biased decisions, but we don't accept that computers make biased decisions. So the simple fact, and I also talked to that in my in my to my clients when we talked about uh, uh, taking bias out of the recruitment process. If I move from a company that currently uh, a junior HR resource goes through hundreds of resumes to pick the 10, 15 for interviews, by definition, that person spent, uh, by research, 7.4 seconds on the resume. By definition, they look at three things, and they're all very biased. If I then come up with a process that significantly improves that, but it is still, it's still a little bit biased, we then forget the fact that we've made a significant improvement. And then sometimes I, 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 <laughs> we lose. It's, a, it's my favorite example of, of Wi Fi in planes. When we have no Wi Fi in planes, we didn't complain. I want to say another word. We didn't complain about it. Now we've got Wi Fi in planes, and if it's gone for 30 minutes, everybody's complaining to the stewardess about we don't have Wi Fi on the plane. <laughs> uh, so sometimes, yeah. sometimes I think we take that forward. Yeah, sorry, I, but I, no, I, I totally agree. I, um, but of course, this is another bias. 
um, uh, we, we, we have an unconscious bias that machines can be perfectible, whereas we understand that humans can't be. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we impose that bias on, on, on the AI systems as well. Yeah, well, I think we can have a, a very we can have another thirty minute conversation of taking that taking that thought forward, Anton. But I just to uh, just to just we've used up most of our time, Sorry. haven't we, Paul? <laughs> we have indeed. Um, and any any concluding th if if you have to advise an HR director in in emerging markets in Asia and Africa, and he's interested, he's read up a bit about HR. What's the first step that, in your view, he or she should do? Use it. It's as simple as that. Just find, find, find an application, find a local vendor, actually, rather than someone who's a long way away, and, and just experiment. Um, do some rapid prototyping, put something in place, ring fence it if you're very worried about that, but just have a go. And it's actually really really straightforward to have a go and and in the in the practical experience there you will learn a lot and immediately come to understand both its limitations and the possibilities and then you just build step by step until you have got a whole integrated suite over a two or three year period and not just educate yourself but educate everyone in your function fantastic Thank you. I know that uh, that you've offered me that uh, some of the slides that you've that you've shared of that we have that you have shared on the, on this screen, I can share with uh, with the viewers. Of uh, so, if you allow me, if you allow me, I invite people that are interested in getting a copy to just leave their email address in the in the comments, uh, and then rest me no more than uh, to thank you very very much, Anton, for. Uh, for 50 minutes of a wonderful conversation. I know that we have another three hours if you want to, and maybe I can I can attempt or I can tempt you over next time to talk about uh, the, uh, the the business components of implementing HR of AI for HR, uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so rest me not more than to say uh, thank you to Sujat, Serish, Usman, Shabazz, Iqbal, Essen, Bakas, Yanara, and Amjad for their questions. Uh, that was really helpful to uh, to keep the conversation uh, flowing. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for attending. Uh, see you in two weeks, Anton. Thank you very much. And well, uh, thank you and very much for the conversation, Paul. No, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, and uh, speak to you soon. Cheers.